That is Mount St. Helens. It's an active volcano in the Cascade Range. And if it looks a little droopy, it's because in 1980, it actually blew its top and there was a lateral blast. Now some of the hazards associated with Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980 included the ash column that traveled all the way to Montana and the pyroclastic flows and also something else. A lot of the glaciers on that mountain actually melted off and gathered the water with the, all the other debris into what we call lahars, which are basically debris flows or mud flows that came thundering down the mountainside. That is actually one of the largest hazards in a lot of these Cascade volcanoes. Let's take a look at another Cascade volcano that's even bigger than Mount St. Helens and see what havoc it could wreak. <laughs> And there it is, Mount Rainier. Welcome back to Let's Go Geo, everyone. As usual, I'm your field guide, Heather, and today we are exploring a U.S. volcano. That volcano, Mount Rainier, is over 14,400 feet tall, making it nearly the size of the tallest mountain in the contiguous U.S., that is Mount Whitney. Now, it's much taller than Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens, even before it erupted in 1980, was around nine, over 9,000 feet, and it lost about 1,300 feet, making it now sit around 8,300 feet tall. So even before its eruption, Mount Rainier was still much taller than it at over 14,000 feet. It's also capped by lots of glaciers. There are over 25 glaciers and, and snow fields on Mount Rainier. It's actually one of the most glaciated peaks, again, in the contiguous US. So lots of glaciers and really tall. So the question is, is will that erupt in our lifetime? And if it does, how bad will it be? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to take a look at Mount Rainier's eruptive past. Mount Rainier's history actually goes back many millions of years. And if you take a look at this map here of the U.S. West Coast Cascade Mountains. Take a look at where Rainier is and St. Helens and some of the other Cascade volcanoes. Do you notice anything interesting? Well, if you look at those volcanoes, they seem to appear in a north-south trending line. Why is that? Well, of course, there's very good geologic reason for this. The U.S. West Coast sits along a convergent plate boundary. A convergent boundary in plate tectonics is one where two plates are colliding and where they collide it forms what's called a volcanic arc or a line of volcanoes that are parallel to the boundary. We call this a subduction zone because where the plates collide one plate subducts or sinks below the other. In this case the Juan de Fuca plate is sinking below the North American plate. The Juan de Fuca plate is oceanic lithosphere. Lithosphere is just a fancy term for the rigid outer shell of the earth that makes up those moving tectonic plates. And the North American plate represents the continental lithosphere. And that oceanic lithosphere is denser than the continental lithosphere that it sinks Now, below. as that plate sinks, it melts. And as it does so, less dense material, including water and gases, begins to rise. That material, aids in the melting of the rock around it. This all contributes to forming a magma chamber. And if there's a disruption, like an earthquake, boom, a volcano erupts. If I shook up a can of soda and gave it to you, would you be afraid to open it? Of course you would, because violent shaking causes changes in pressure and an eruption of the material within. Well, the same physics apply to volcanoes, and violent shaking does occur within Earth. Earthquakes indicate movement of material and can warn of a volcanic eruption. That's why seismologists closely monitor earthquake activity around volcanoes like Mount Rainier. The good news is that this means we'll have some warning before an eruption. Now, just any earthquake or even earthquake swarms, as scary as that might sound, don't necessarily mean an eruption is coming. In fact, if you follow earthquake activity of these volcanoes, you'll notice the high frequency of minor earthquakes around them. It does, however, remind us that these Cascade volcanoes are certainly active and near certain to erupt again soon. But how do we know when and should we be concerned about a Mount Rainier eruption? 
Mount Rainier's eruptive history is actually less frequent and less voluminous than, say, Mount St. Helens and some of its other siblings in the Cascade Range. This is because furiosity depends on viscosity. In other words, Mount Rainier's magma seems to be less viscous or sticky than its counterparts. Think of molasses versus water and infusing air into those substances. Which one do you think would be more explosive? Rock units from past Mount Rainier eruptions seem to be primarily of andesite composition. There's some dacite and some pumice as well. Igneous rocks can be classified by their chemistry. At one end of the scale of volcanic rocks, we find rhyolite. It's light in color, it's silica rich, and it tends to be more viscous. And at the other end of the scale, we find basalt, which as you can see, is darker. And that's because it's lower in silica. It's higher in iron and magnesium minerals. And it tends to be more fluid. Now in the middle is where we find rocks like andesite. And therefore, having the deposits around Mount Rainier of these andesite rocks and even some basalt tells us that Rainier didn't always have massive eruptions. Going back about a half a million years ago to the early days of Mount Rainier, the rock record seems to suggest a highly active period, as indicated by steeply dipping or angled beds that stretch out radially from the summit. Then a generally quiet period with only minor eruptions seems to have occurred interrupted by the 380,000 year old Rampart Ridge lava flow. Then for about 100,000 years, extensive lava accumulated. On the west flanks of Rainier are 200,000 year old rocks that tell us that Rainier was growing and magma was on the move. Dikes, which are tabular intrusions, pushed magma through weaker overlying rocks and toward volcanic vents where eruptions occurred. The next 100,000 years again were relatively quiet. There were eruptions around 130,000 years and 105,000 years ago, but both of these rocks indicate that these eruptions were movement of fluid material at depth and not lateral explosions from surficial magma material. 40,000 years ago, eruptions again intensified and the mountain was on if the rise. If we could take a look at 20,000 years ago, we'd see a true scene of fire and ice as volcanic eruptions occurred as glacial ice dominated North America. After those glaciers retreated since around 11,000 years ago, off and on activity has the occurred. The mud flow was a huge lahar deposit and it was dated at 5,600 years ago and we see that it actually reached Puget Sound. Geologists can examine tephra, rock types, and related deposits to determine past volcanic activity and establish dates of prior eruptions. One thing these deposits are telling us, along with observations from Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980 and a look at topo maps, is a warning about lahars. Now I can't emphasize enough the importance of those glaciers here. Glaciers have played a very important role in Mount Rainier's past. It's been a struggle between glaciers eroding material and that volcano depositing material. For much of its history, Rainier was covered in thick glacial ice. In fact, the glacial ice was so thick, which we can see from deposits known as till. Till is formed from the debris dropped by glaciers, like the modern one you see pictured here. The Hayden Creek Till, deposited about 150,000 years ago, is found around 2,000 feet above the valley. That's some thick ice. For much of Rainier's past, the mountain was covered by thick ice. In fact, it was so thick that moving lava would just cool off, leaving behind hardened ridges of rock. That's not the case today, however. It might look like a mighty covering of ice, but it's not as thick as it's been in the past, and the lava would cause rapid ice melt and those destructive lahars. And as we know from Rainier's past and the, the 1980 St. Helens eruption, these lahars can travel quite far, quite fast. The 40,000 year old Ricksecker Point lava flow supports this idea. Columnar joints form when basaltic lava fractures into hexagonal pillars as it cools. Well, these Ricksecker basalt pillars run horizontally, suggesting the lava flowed right on across the glaciers rather than being subdued by it. When it does go off, there will be warning signals. An increase in earthquakes, a change in the volcanic gas emissions, changes in soil temperature, land deformation and swelling. 
these things are monitored by the USGS and you can actually see what's being monitored on the USGS website here. They're actually putting in some new lahar monitoring systems as well recently. When it does erupt, an eruption cloud will expand up into the atmosphere and debris will fall over the area. This material, collectively referred to as tephra, will be accompanied by fine ash, which can travel quite far. During the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption, ash was actually collected from cars as far away as Idaho and Montana. The sulfuric content of the material can cause acid rain. Down the side of the volcano at rapid speeds will come rumbling debris, pyroclastic flows, from small to medium-sized volcanic bombs and blocks as big as cars. Of course, hot molten lava will flow from vents, but this is perhaps not all the biggest threats during the eruptions of Cascade volcanoes like Mount Rainier. Again, lahars will pose a great hazard. In 1985, Nevado del Ruiz erupted in Colombia and it killed 23,000 people. And what's interesting is the deaths occurred primarily due to the lahars. And even more interesting is that this has happened before, in the 1800s and the 1500s. It turns out the town was actually built on prior lahar deposits. Furthermore, lahars can even happen without a volcanic eruption. This is why volcanologists say that lahars may be Mount Rainier's biggest threat. So there you have it, Mount Rainier, a beautiful mountain at the confluence of fire and ice. I hope you enjoyed this excursion into the Cascade Mountain geology. Stay tuned because we'll be talking more about igneous geology, volcanoes, we'll be looking at some other volcanoes, and related geological topics here at Let's Go Geo. So if you're not already subscribed and you love to go on these virtual field trips with me, subscribe and join me on the next adventure. See you there.